Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together as we welcome the amazing, the powerful Ini Abimbola. Please put your hands together. Is that together. the best you can do? Thank you, Ma, for graciously staying with us from the beginning till this time. I've been at one of your sessions before, Ezekiel Shalesi, and it was Thank amazing. You. Thank you, Ma. Welcome. Hello, everyone. Ah. You people want me to miss my brother more. Hello, everyone. So this, I came here this morning and, you know, I had to self-talk. You know, I did a lot of, you know, self-motivating in the morning before I left the house. And even in the car, I kept talking to myself. And one of the things I said to myself that I wasn't going to cry, you know, because I knew they were going to do, you know, a reel of um, my younger brother, Ubon King. And, but I couldn't hold it, you know, when um, the reel came on. And, and that goes to show how much um, Ubong's influence and impact was. I am a solid case for impact. I talk about impact. I talk about legacy. I talk about these things because when you come from the kind of background that I came from, um, and you see how life has been. And that's why what my brother, um, Mr. Puta, talked about was very critical. Because if you don't learn from the things that you've been through, then when, when are you going to learn? In the grave? So it's important that we learn every single day. And so my brother, Ubon, really was, you know, I, I am one of, that pers one of those people that are self-motivated, because uh, if you come from the background that I came from, you know, Dr. Akin said he, they were in money before. How many of you attended the first Tinkation 2018? Ah, very few people. Okay. This life is not for those children that you are bringing up. Life will teach them and they will end up back in your house if you're not careful. You and I have been created to nurture, to tend to take care and to make this earth better. You are not created for you and you alone. You are created to be a blessing. A lot of people are only beginning to understand what it means to be a comedian. It is not different from being a doctor. It is not different from being an architect. It is service delivery. And when an elephant was young, they tied a rope to its leg. When it became big, the only way to hold that elephant is by tying that same rope to its leg. It is your belief that has given that thing the strength. Hey. To... So I, know, I usually tell my story. And the reason why I tell my story is also because, for example, I can see young people in the audience. And it's important that you listen and you learn. Because most of the things that have been said today are things that if you pay attention they will make a whole lot of difference in the way you think. Because the way you think is the determining factor of what will happen in your life at any given point in time. Irrespective of where you come from. The way you think, the way you condition your mind to think. And that's why Tinkation became something that was like a personal project for me. Even though I started running away from last year because I didn't want to cry, you know. But this morning now, you may made me cry, you know. Um, but it was me missing Ubong because in spite of that, Ubong was somebody that he could just call me from the blues and say, Big Sis, um, I can feel your spirit that you are down. I'm like, what was the meaning of that? I'm sending you a goat, a whole goat, and then I'll see a goat in my compound. So that's the kind of person that he was. And I really do miss him, but I'm so excited that we are able to keep this going because this was Ubong's dream. The ability to get people to think. Education is not enough. You can be an educated illiterate. Education is just, it's just a means. It's just an enabler. You can have all the education, you can have, you know, the qualifications and still be an idiot. And so the, the, the determining factor is how you think. So when people read my profile and see 
um, you know, the things that I've been able to do. And they see that, oh, she went to Stanford, she went to Harvard. They're like, you know, all those children that were, all these butter children, maybe like Dr. Aki, all the children that their parents had money before. You understand? But the problem was that my own parents did not even have more. There was no knee. We didn't have. As in, M, we didn't have. My father was a roadside watch repairer. And this was not a watch repairer. So I grew up, I was born about six decades ago. Calculate that. Yes. I was born about six decades ago. And I was born to a family that... My father was the last born of his family, of his mother, actually, because it was also a polygamous family. It was a royal family, and his father was the fifth wife. So in a royal household, you get to have plenty children. So he was one of the many children. But for his mom, he was the third and the last. And he didn't have a lot of education. Of course, his mom was a trader. He had to learn how to trade. By the time he finished standard six, he had to go and learn how to repair watches. So my father was a roadside watch repairer. Not the roadside watch repairer. Now, these days, they have, you know, those MTN umbrellas to cover them. Some of them have shops. No, he had to sit by the roadside. And when it rains, he always had a nylon. I grew up seeing that nylon where he had all his tools. You know, so he, he was this baco sack, but it was the cement one that you had to put hole because there was no baco sack then. So it was cement bag, you use knife to put hole, and then he carried it because that's where he had his tools. So he would stand when the rain finishes, he will come out again and sit just by somebody's store. Sometimes he was paying 10 naira or 5 naira or 2 naira for just sitting there. And that's the household I was born into. My mom was just a petty trader. She used to sell crayfish by the house. Tomorrow she will sell orange. Next tomorrow, you know, it depends on whichever product is moving at any given point in time. And so we were always hungry. I grew up knowing hunger. I understood what hunger is. I understood how hungry you could be to steal. And I'm saying that very clearly so you understand. How that's a child, a growing child, that is so hungry, maybe not eating two days and just had water or maybe a, a, a small piece of bread to eat. That's the kind of household I grew up. We were always hungry. And I said we didn't have M, so you know the remaining four. There was nothing. So if my father doesn't go out, and like I said, he didn't have a shop or somewhere to go. He has to go around asking people then, do you want to repair your watch? I can service you. It's not today that all of us are wearing watch. Those days, people don't wear watches like that. But they had all those big war clocks. How many of you remember the chiming war clocks? I'm sure you've seen it. This young children of today. You know, those grandfather wall clocks, you know? So he used to repair those ones, you know? He used to move around and repair those ones. And some days he will go from morning till night and come back with nothing. Most of the people can't afford to pay him, so they will give him food stuff. They can give him a small piece of okra. Some will give him pepper. So I remember growing up knowing how to prepare okra and pepper and make a batu eat with it. Nice soup. Just add salt. There was nothing like magi or anything. Just salt, okra and pepper. And we'll make, we, what, Gary was from the farm that my mother planted by the house. So we would have removed the cassava. So I know how to do all those things. You peel the cassava, soak it. We'll make gari and fufu from it because that's our, that's our means of eating. If we don't do that, there's no food. Or my mom will go and beg because she had to do that sometimes when her children were very hungry. She will go to the neighbors and beg for a cup of rice or a cup of gari so that you know we can either drink or just make something out of it. I remember once we were young, um, I think maybe I was about 12, um, my younger brother, he was like the fourth one, um, we hadn't eaten all day, my dad hadn't come back, my mom didn't have anything, um, so our neighbor had just finished removing Titus fish, that's why I hate Titus fish today by the way, so she had just finished peeling Titus fish and she dumped it in the dustbin. 
And my younger brother was so hungry, he went to the dustbin and started eating the, the, the pills. And my father was coming in at that time and saw him. And that was the first time I saw my father cry. He broke down and he wept bitterly. But then, there was nothing. He didn't have an education. But one of the things my father was resilient about was making sure that his children went to school. And that was the good thing about the fact that we had public schools that we could. I went to public schools. I went to Zumaratu Islamia Primary School, even though my father had tried very much to put me through nursery school. So I was one of the first few students to attend Hope Children's School in Apapa. Because my father, after some time, graduated to sitting under one of the bridges in Apapa. He found a place and, you know, you could put a table under one of those bridges. Because that was when Port Authority had started. A lot of companies were moving to Apapa. So that was a good graduation for us because at least he had somewhere, you know, there was no sun and all of that. So I went to Hope Children's School, Apapa. And then from there to Zumirati Islamia Primary School. And then from there to Amur Dauphin Secondary School in Mile 2, right at Mile 2 bus stop. And then from there, I did uh, from one to three. And from there, we moved, you know, because we were so poor. So when the rent increased around Amor Dauphin, we started moving. The first one was that we moved to Ajangbadi. How many of you know Ajangbadi? <laughs> okay, maybe the adults. There's a place down, down called Ajangbadi. Then from there, we now entered inside, we went to Okokomaiko, because the rent was a bit lower. Then after the rent, you know, in Okoko, uh, became something. We went back to Ajangbadi. This time around, further in. Then the rent in Ajangbadi became, well, meanwhile, this rent is that is one room and parlor for six children and father and mother. How many people? Good. From there, we now decided that, look, the rent was too much. We now moved to Badagri. Uh, <laughs> nearer the border. So I grew up in Badagri. I did my Form 4 and Form 5 in Badagri Grammar School. And I was, the, I, was, I, was, I, was I, I hated everything about our life. I was a very conscious child because my parents were also very conscious people. In as much as they didn't have, but they were also conscious about their spirituality and in, in you know, investing in us to say, we were good people. We may not have money, but we are good people. And I think that got me into the place of consistently thinking about my life. I started thinking about my life at a very early age. I was unhappy with the situation. I didn't hate my parents because they did the best that they could. But I didn't like it. So the first thing is that you must really hate the situation that you are in. You must hate it enough to wake up and do something. Ubon King used to talk about the African lion. That the lion wakes up and knows that food is going to come now. Because food will come. But the gazelle wakes up and does what? And keeps running. Because if it doesn't run, the lion is going to eat it up. You must hate your situation enough to wake up every morning to be thinking of how to run. And that's what you hear from every speaker that had spoken this morning. They didn't just hate their situation and begin to complain and begin to look for one uncle to help them, one auntie, or oh, you didn't support my, my father's brother is very wicked, he has money. Nobody owes you anything. Absolutely nothing. Even if there is your father's twin, they have the same DNA. If your father is Taiwo, he's Kainde. Your father's Kainde does not owe you anything. Nobody. You owe yourself everything that you become. Ef absolutely everything. So, from there, I, you know, put so much effort into my books because that was the only thing. My uniform was the worst. Our clothes were horrible. So, I didn't have friends. And when you don't have friends, you know, it's these days when I hear about, you know, mental health issues, that children are depressed because they don't have friends. Ah, Piti Bawo. <laughs> I don't understand. What's depressing you? If my children know in my house, they know there's nothing. You can't be depressed. <laughs> you can't. There are too many things to do for you to be depressed. Say, because I don't have a friend, they don't like me. My, I have a retirement benefit. Her name is Miriam. She's seven. And she comes back from school and she says to me, I was like, oh, every day, how was school? Even now when I'm out, how was school today? What happened? Tell me what happened. And she's like, Caleb came today. 
And he wanted me to give him my second pencil. And I said, no. And he said, he's not playing with me again. And I said, well, that's fine because I really don't like playing with you before. I said, aha. Now me bore you. <laughs> you can't be depressed. We are too rugged for that. You have to get yourself ruggedy. Because I think it was the spoken words. Life is not a gentleman. Life is going to slap you left, right, and center. Life will wake you up with knocks. Life will wake you up with bitterness. Life will wake you up with anger. It is your choice what you decide to do when life wakes you up. I was, I was, I was a Bukati Washington. Have you heard the story of Bukati? I didn't read book like Chris. So from form four, I was made the senior prefect girl. I was senior prefect girl in form four and form five. I went to school when men went to school. I didn't go to school when children went to school. The people in my class, they were too tight. You see, that's why I always wear, do you see my shoe? That's why I always wear high heel because I have to elevate small. I was small. And the, the, the boys in my class, they were men. We used to wear short knicker when we went to school that time. So they were men in my class. Most of them were boys of traders in Agbalata Market in Badagri. So as senior prefect girl, if I talk, they, they would just conk my head. So I had to be rugged. I had to be strong. I was really small. I was smallish. But I was the senior prefect girl. Now when we got to the final form five, our final exam was 75 Naira. My parents could not afford it. We were 32 students. I was the 32nd student and the senior preferred girl, the only person who didn't pay. And so the vice principal was a Ghanaian. He looked at the list and said, we have 32 students. How come only 31 have paid? 75 Naira, not 750, not 75. 75 Naira, if you remove... 25 naira from 100 naira. That's what it is. And they said, oh, senior preferred girl didn't pay. And he's like, oh, she called me to his office. I said, well, my father, everybody knew my father. So those of you that used to lie, my father used to repair watch in the market. When you just enter the market, you just see my father. So I could not lie that, you know, my father went to the UK. We are from the UK. I could not lie. Everybody would, ah, in me. It's not your baba that is a uh, repair watch by the corner of the petrol station by Liz. Is that the inni? I could not lie. So everybody knew my father. So I said, I was really. So that afternoon, he went to the market and he spoke to my dad. And my dad said, he doesn't have it. And the school paid the 75 naira for me to do the final exam. Now, at that stage, we had gotten, then was when the influx of these international schools, universities abroad used to come into Nigeria. They had come into Badai Grammar School because it was a legacy school. Badai Grammar School is one of those secondary schools that we call legacy schools. So they had come and, you know, showed us ways of how we could apply for university, you know, um, um, education abroad and get scholarships. Long story short, so that's because of my time. I applied and I got 15 scholarships. 15. It, it's nice, Abby. <laughs> we, we, I didn't have photo, not passport, oh, photo. Then they now said we need passports. <laughs> I think passports then was one ridiculous amount of money. I can't even remember. First of all, somebody that cannot pay 75 naira. You now pay, I think, 120, 120 naira for passport. And then we were in Badagri, remember? We used to call this side of Lagos, coming to Lagos. So, so the idea was that if you had to have passport, you have to come to Lagos. Transport money to come from Badagri to Lagos. All the 15 scholarships. My father helped me, kept, he kept all of them for me. I saw all the papers. In fact, one of them, Beria College, gave me full scholarship for a four-year program. My father kept those documents for me until I was 25. I bought them when I was 30. Because at 30, every single dream that I wanted to have, I'd already started, you know, living those dreams. What am I saying to you? This is not all of my story. So when people read my profile and say, oh, Harvard, Stanford Fellow at Harvard. I was a Stanford Fellow, 2008 Stanford Fellow, Rule of Law and Democracy at Stanford. I was my class governor. 
And in that class, I was the only Nigerian woman who had never been a politician, who had never been a member of parliament, because it was strictly for members of parliament and ex-politicians who were now working in advocacy issues or legislative issues. But I was the class governor of that class. What am I saying to you? Your dreams are valid. Your dreams are valid. And it doesn't matter who your father or your mother is. It doesn't matter where you come from. I come from a state that they call the house boy and house guest state. I'm a proud Aquatum woman. Though I was born and brought up in Lagos, I'm a full-blown Lagosian, as I like to call myself, because I was born, bred, buttered, garnished, cooked in Lagos. I speak better Yoruba than most Lagosians, and I say that with my full chest. But I chose. What is resilience? The topic says resilience and reinvention. What is resilience? Resilience is the ability to rebound. The ability to bounce back. The ability not to remain down. The ability not to agree that it is over when it's not over. Resilience is the ability to say, I lost money when they devalued the currency, but I'm not going to allow that to devalue my life. Resilience is saying that my father sells in the market, in the in Mushi market. He sells wood or he sells plastic. My mother cooks food. That is, resilience says to you that you're going to look at that situation and you're going to find something that will encourage you from that situation. Aki said it was easy to give up. It was easy to say my father get them before. It was easy to say we used to eat a bag of rice. Today we are eating, a, we have to borrow one cup of rice. You can decide that that is the image you want to carry for the rest of your life. I had an image of abundance. I had a dream. You know, this thing when Martin Luther King said, I had a dream. Trust me, I had a dream. I had a dream about the kind of house I will live. I am living in that house. Unime, you can testify. I had a dream of how I wanted to be addressed. I am being addressed by that. Because the men and women that I have met in my life, I am the person that brought the former, the former president of Ireland into this country for the first time for a conference, the Africa CEO Roundtable and Conference on Sustainability. I am the same woman that brought the former prime minister of Norway into Nigeria for the first time for the same conference. I'm the same woman that brought even the former president of the AFDB to Nigeria. I have done incredible work and I can stand here and beat my chest that I came from nothing but I am not standing on nothing. I am the proud daughter of a watch repairer who can afford to buy the most expensive and by the way, the most expensive watches are not Rolexes. I can afford it. Why? Because I've worked hard. I don't have a politician, Father. I am not a politician. But he says, See thou a man diligent in his ways. When you work hard, Aki said, the men will look for you. Men will see your hard work. And that hard work will speak for you. How did I get into university? I didn't get into university until I got married. I married at an early age. Because I was looking for how to come up for this poverty. Come up for the hunger. I had married a man that my agreement with him was that you go send me go school. Though. That was the agreement. I married a man that my parents did not agree. I married a man that my parents did not approve of. In fact, they did not approve to the point that he did not pay dowry. That's how bad it was. And I had three children in that marriage. And I went to, well, long and short, I went to school. Eh? I went to school. I had a first degree. But it was also, again, one of the things you need to learn as you reinvent yourself is that in the place where you are standing, a lot of options will be open to you. Please mind the options that you choose. A lot of options. Drugs is an option, particularly for those of you in secondary school now. We have a terrible, terrible, terrible drug.
drug incidents in Nigeria. And for parents, if you are not paying attention, sorry for you. Trust me, the things that your 10-year-olds are doing, you will die if you find out. Trust me, because I am working with a lot of children and I'm counseling a lot of parents who are walking through it. That phone, you decide to give that child at 10. What is, the, what is inside the phone? I am one of those old school mothers that will never change. A child has no business with a telephone until they are 12 years old. I have, and that 12 years old, go, ba, ba. <laughs> they are not getting a smartphone. They are getting a phone that I can control from anywhere. Because we must become like hawks. Resilience is about ensuring that the path that you are walking is guided. You must be able to think about those things. Options will open, but what are the options you are choosing? My dear young boys and young girls, there are a lot of people that will come and tell you, if you just help me pass this drug to that neighbor where they there, I'll give you 2,000 naira. And you begin to do it. But before you know it, you are selling your soul to the devil. Please do not look at the circumstances with which you have grown. Look at the opportunities. What has been spoken concerning you? I remember someday somebody just said something in person. He said, your name is Ini. Ini Abasi. My name is Ini Abasi. It means God's time. And the person said, you know, people who be in Abasi, God's time. God time, they long go. The person said it like that. And he said it as a joke. But it ministered something else to me. I heard it in a different way. Mind you, when I talk about ministry, and I want you to understand, I wasn't brought up in a church. I grew up as a Jehovah's Witness. So by the age of 11, I had finished reading the Bible. It was compulsory. I had read the Bible back to back. I got baptized at the age of 12. Which means I was ready <laughs> to become an evangelist at the age of 12. So if it comes to Bible, I know I'm back to back. I'm married to a Muslim. I've read the Quran back to back. There's nothing you are going to tell me. Whatever it is that has been created in you, it is not for you to remain small. In fact, we offend the senses of the Almighty when we decide to become small. When we use every situation that is happening to us, God gives you pregnancy. Because you are having problems with the pregnancy, you become lax with your work. You are not a faithful person. You are not a loyal person. You cannot be trusted. They send you something for 5000 You buy 4000 Pocket 1000 You cannot grow. Excellence is that I will be resilient even in the smallest of things. And trust me, not only are men watching, God is watching. And God does not wait for man. The person that God is going to use to bless you is steady. He has not gone anywhere. All you need to do is like as they say, stand at the gates. Be ready. His Dr. Ogochuko said he will wear his school uniform and he will be at the gate. Oh, trust me, I used to read like a mad woman. And so when the opportunity came for somebody to help me, the person knew that he was not wasting his money. I have lived as a housemaid. I moved from my father's house to my uncle's house. My uncle's house. My uncle. Did you hear what I said? My uncle's house. But I was a housemaid in my uncle's house. He didn't send me to school. But his children went to school. In 2017, I was coming back from one of the countries, in, one of the states in the U.S. And I got to Dulles, Washington Dulles. And I, and I found a young man staring at me. And I was like, all these people that they will come and tell me that, oh, I know you from somewhere. So I kept my face straight. And after a while, he walked up to me. He said, is your name Ine? I said, yes. He said, you don't know me. I said, no, of course he was older than me. I said, I don't know you. He said, you don't know me. He said, ah, I am Uncle Achibong's son. That was my uncle's son. And that young man, I got him a job when we got back to Nigeria. Many of you have people living with you. They're not your children. But you treat them like trash. Your children 
you will buy ready-made for them, you will buy um, bend down select. Even though all of us, they wear bend down select now. Because economy don't bad. You will buy that one for them. Oh, when you buy boga for your children, you buy a uh, boga king or domino pizza, you ask them to eat bread. God is watching. He's a, he's a God of humor. It is not all those things you're doing for your children that will make them better. What character are you investing in them? When people, when you are given opportunity to have people's children live with you, Mr. Puta said it. He said his grandmother will collect all that children. We were six. My father had six children. But at any given point in time, with their poverty, we were up to 12. I don't know where this other streets, cats, and dogs came from. But we were always 12. And you know the funny thing? In my life, I am consistently having... My mother says you always have strays around you. But he said something. He said, get a ministry. That is my ministry. To invest in the life of as many as I can. So that I can extend my wealth. So that I can extend. He says, Jabez said, enlarge my course. What do you think he was asking for? Enlarge people through me. Enlarge me. Because when people know me through this person, I will be enlarged. Many of you, God just give you small money. Your noses are high. The neighbors, the malams around you come to ask for water. You can never open your gates to give water. Reinvent yourself. I ask today that for you to overcome every challenge, for you to overcome things that seem like they will break you. Many of you, I know you have questions. Well, how did you get to Harvard? How did you get to Stanford? People. People. My name, my, my name was just listed in a list and the next thing, I got a letter from Stanford inviting me that I've been nominated as a fellow to stay one year. And I came back as fellow from Stanford in 2018 and I went back 2019, 20, tw what am I saying? 2008, sorry, not 2018. I'm a 2008 Draper Hill Stanford fellow. So I came back in 2008. Remember I said I was my class governor? By 2009, I was invited again to be with the new class of fellows. So I went 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012. And that opened up a lot of opportunities for me. People. People, you know, Akin said something. He says he has a, he has, it's like his lifeblood. When he, when he sits near people, he has to know them. Many of us find it difficult when you see people you can't even greet. How do you intend to reinvent your life? God is not going to come down. God is going to use people to change your lives. And the last thing that I want to say here, I said there's a price to success. You can define success. My own is as long as I can eat rice and drink tea. You know, my own is tea or any kind of tea, bring it. I'm a tea woman. My pot of tea, I don't use a cup to drink tea. I use pots to drink tea. Once I have rice and I have tea, I'm fine. In fact, I'm successful. You can define your own success. But there's a price to success. And I said what? Dedication. You must be dedicated to the path that you call called to. If you have decided that I am the one that will end poverty in my family, you must be dedicated to it. And knowledge is a good way to be dedicated. Eat knowledge. Eat it like food. Learn everything. Learn everything learnable. I know how to skin a cow and do pomo because when I lived in Addis Ababa, that's another different story. Oh. I lived in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia for 10 years. I worked as a consultant <clears throat> at the African Union and the UN Economic Commission for Africa. I worked as a consultant and I lived in Ethiopia for 10 years. As a diplomat's wife, I could not work the first few five years. So what did I do? I started cooking food for all the Africans. Ghanaian, uh, we had all the Africans listed in the African Union. I would cook food for them. They started saying, a lot of them, oh, that woman, she didn't go to school, but she can cook good food. It's okay. That's your mouth. You can talk whatever you want. I had all my degrees in my pocket. I eat knowledge, but I was eating knowledge. I 
was going to school. I was reading. I was earning certificates. While they were there, there were other women there who say, I didn't go to school. They went to school. But so since they went to school, they just sit in their house. Me, I didn't go to school. I just continue eating the certificate. Eat knowledge. Read about everything. I understood sports. I remember investing $1,000 in Asena. As you see me, so I'm an Asena. Fan. Even if we win today, we know win tomorrow. God lasts forever. As you see me like this. So you learn because these opportunities will keep coming up. So feed yourself knowledge. How many of you have seen me in the next Ford adverts? Next Ford University adverts. So, two years ago, when COVID-19 struck, because my mind does not sleep. Some of you, when you lie down, you sleep. You forget about life. How dare you be sleeping? Who will say you are sleeping? You are sleeping into poverty. How can you sleep? When you don't have money, you are sleeping. Ha! Ah. You dare not sleep. So 2020, when COVID started, I was like, what am I going to do? Even though we are going to be indoors, what am I going to do? I saw this next word advert. I said, ah, all these uh, bogus universities, I found out that they were accredited. I decided to do the MBA because I have a master's. I have a master's in management already. I had left University of Calabar 30 years before. This is 32 years I left University of Calabar. So I decided to do an MBA. But when I saw all the curriculum, I said, ha, a failure was looking at me like a very nice something. So I decided, okay, maybe I should do the bachelor's. So I registered for the bachelor's degree. I finished the bachelor's degree. It was a two and a half year program. I finished it in 18 months. I started the MBA. The MBA is a one year program, but depends on how many courses you can take. Well, they said take one course per month. I took four courses per month. 16 courses I finished in four months. Eat knowledge. The route to success starts from what you know. The second thing I wrote here, hard work. Oh, they say work smart, not hard work. Me, I, I no go school reach that one. Oh. All I know is hard work. You can ask smart work because sometimes smart work is yahoo, yahoo. But add smart work because we are digitalized now. But you need to work hard. And work hard means you are constantly thinking of ways to reinvent yourself. You're constantly thinking, what else can I do? Many of you have skills, but you don't want to use it. You are ashamed of what people can say. As you see me like this, I can remove this wig, put water on top of my head, and start going on, on the on Zumba Mbadi way, because I don't send anybody as long as it's going to give me food. Some of you are ashamed. What will people say? <laughs> yeah, Waga. How do they call it? Uh, Oga wife. What do you want to be? A guy wife. I don't want to be a guy wife. I want to be a guy. Do you understand what I'm saying? So I have to work hard. Um, Ivy took us to Uyo about six years ago. It's more than that. 2013. Can you imagine? She took us there to go and speak English. We spoke to encourage all the women. She now brought uh, some people to teach the women how to do soap. They do soap and everything. Me, I cuckoo sat down in the class. I was taking my notes. All of them were laughing. When I started producing my soap, nobody was laughing again. My husband is tired of me because he thinks that <laughs> we don't know which business we are doing anymore. But how do Yoruba say it? Uh, I have four. The number three thing, a, dis, a devotion to getting things done. You must be devoted to getting things done. You cannot be haphazard about things. They give you an assignment, you won't finish it. They ask you to deliver on something, you will not deliver it to the top. As a consultant, I started my, I started my consulting firm in 2009. This is practice consulting. For the first three years, we struggled. I didn't have an office. I was squatting in people's office. The first office we squatted was Alibaba's office. I squatted in Alibaba's office. No, not Alibaba's office. I squatted in a friend's office. After one year, the business was looking like it was going to grow. In fact, it was in that one year that I decided to bring the president of Ireland. The guy said, oh, this one has money. You don't want to take office. Kick me out of the office. I went and squatted with Alibaba. We squatted in Alibaba's office for three years before we were able to make profit enough to get an office. And I was consulting. Before we started consulting for banks. That's why I said knowledge. One of the things that I do with my clients... If you ask me to consult, and I, by the way, I can consult on anything. That's the thing about knowledge. 
not only are you just a little bit here, a little bit here. No, you find out that as you seek knowledge, you have an in-depth opportunity to, to, you know, just swallow up everything that you need to know. I started my office. I was consulting. One of the things my clients will say to you, if you give us 70%, we will deliver 140%, 100% more. So at any point in time, you are going to look for me. Oh, you are going to look for me. If it is to deliver. I remember somebody gave my name to a governor of a state and said, look, this project you want to do, I know one lady. She's not a nice person. But I'm telling you exactly how the governor told me. That she's not a nice person. She's a, she, let me use the word. She's, she's, she's a bitch. But if you want somebody that would deliver 110, she's the person. Now, I don't want you to like me, but I want you to respect me. Respect my work. Respect the fact that she did crazy sometimes. But when it comes to deliver, she go deliver. When that is the mantra, people will look for you. But that is not to say you should not have good character. Oh, I'm sweet. I'm the sweetest person. You may you can tell now. I'm the sweetest person. The only reason why people will call me a bitch is because I will not let you. Because if I remove this shoe when I climb now, I will go like this. I will not let you look at me with that size. Do you understand what I mean? And then I've been in positions where people look at it first. Oh, yellow woman. You know, yellow women, they don't need to get sense. They just use fine to they chop. No. Me, I go use fine chop, but I go use my brain. Because Dr. Ogochuku said, your brain is your only asset. With these few words of mine, I hope I've been able to convince you and not confuse you. Nobody is going to place food on the table for you. And you keep eating for 10 years without working for it. Thank you.